In this video, I'm going to talk about Peguvian taxes and Peguvian subsidies, which are very simple um, policies that governments can use to correct markets that have uh, externalities. Peguvian taxes apply to a case where you have a negative externality, so the social cost is greater than the private cost or social cost curve is above the supply curve. Subsidies are what you use to take care of, uh, of markets that have positive externalities where the social value curve is above the demand curve. We're gonna start by talking about Peguvian taxes. I'm gonna to try to keep these graphs kind of as, as clean as possible, so I'm not gonna be writing um, all of the prices and quantities down uh, because what I wanna focus on here is kind of the, the areas of gains from trade and from deadweight loss, all right? So let's recap what the problem is when you have a negative externality. When you have a negative externality, buyers and sellers will keep trading with each other as long as they can benefit themselves. And that's true all the way to this equilibrium point where supply and demand uh, cross over each other, okay? Uh, the problem here is that the buyers and sellers are ignoring the external costs that they're imposing on other people. However, there is a very straightforward, simple uh, solution to this. You can take uh, you can move this supply curve by imposing a tax on the sellers. And remember from our lecture on taxes and subsidies, whatever dollar amount you impose in taxes on the sellers, that's going to shift the supply curve up by an amount equal to that tax because you're increasing the cost of doing business. And so they won't be willing to sell for the same low prices that they were before. When you tax them, they will require higher prices from the buyers in order to produce those same units. So the idea of a Peguvian tax is to impose a tax on the sellers that is equal to the external cost. So if you know what that external cost is that every transaction is imposing on third parties, on bystanders, then you could just go to the sellers in this market and say, listen, every time you make a trade, every time you produce a unit and sell it, we are going to tax you whatever that amount is. Maybe it's $50 per unit in external costs. If that external cost was $50 a unit and you then tax at $50 a unit, you would see this supply curve shift up by exactly $50 per unit. And this is what it has happened on this side of the market. If you impose this tax, you will get to this situation over here where this supply curve is, uh, you know, it's um, the distance between this supply curve and the old one is exactly the same as the distance between the supply curve and the social cost curve. So in this case, the supply curve is exactly overlapping the social cost curve, and we could say they are the same curve. The, social, the supply curve with a tax is equal to the social cost curve. And now, you're gonna be at this point here. This market, its new equilibrium is here, where PE is equal to P star. That might be a little bit difficult to see, but if you bring that price, take the price from, from this graph all the way over to this one, you'll see that that price is consistent with the social optimum, with the, the negative externality, okay? So in this case, the tax makes the market efficient. Now, sometimes uh, students are uh, what would you say? They're, they're reluctant to think that there is no deadweight loss when you impose the negative extra, uh, sorry, when you impose the Peguvian tax because they're used to thinking about taxes and subsidies in the context of uh, chapter, what? Uh, chapter five, I believe, where there are no externalities. And remember, if there was no externality here and we imposed a tax that was the same distance, you would end up with a deadweight loss, right? It would be this area right here, this triangle would be a deadweight loss. However, when there's a negative externality, this would not actually be a deadweight loss. Why is that? Well, it's because 
we only would consider this to be a deadweight loss if the value to everybody was greater than the cost to everybody of producing that good. And, and if there is a negative externality, that's no longer true. If there's a negative externality, all of this area under the social cost curve does not count as surplus to anybody. I mean, it's true that the buyer and the seller are capturing this surplus. They're making themselves better off, but everybody else is losing that exact amount, right? The distance between the social cost and the supply curve. So from a social perspective, nothing under this, between the social cost curve and supply curve, none of that counts as a, as a benefit, as a surplus that could be captured. So when you have this negative externality, all of the available gains from trade are given by this green triangle to the left here. And we don't count anything below the social cost curve as being gains from trade to society. Now, to the right of, equal, of, uh, of this social optimum, you get from Q star to QE, you do have this negative externality. So what's going on here is from these trades, from the social optimum to the equilibrium, Yes, the buyer and seller are making themselves better off, but the cost to society as a whole completely overwhelms or undoes those, those benefits. And more than that, right? You get this deadweight loss is the cost to society in excess of the, the value that was being captured by the buyers and the sellers. And so if you have this uh, this negative externality, you've got these two areas, gains from trade and deadweight loss. This, once you've reached this point, you've captured all the gains from trade and you haven't had any deadweight loss yet. But as soon as you start producing those extra units, you start getting this deadweight loss. Over here, where we've imposed the tax, the equilibrium price and quantity are the same as the socially optimal price and quantity. So we get those gains from trade. With no uh, no deadweight loss offsetting that to the right. Okay, so we have done the best that we can. And the nice thing about a Pigouvian tax is it's very simple. It's very straightforward. All it requires the government to do is figure out what is that external cost. And then the government just has to levy the tax and collect that tax and the market takes care of itself because what that tax does is it forces the seller to internalize that external cost. Every time they produce a unit, they have to behave as though the cost they're imposing on other people is a cost that they themselves have to pay because they do have to pay it. They have to pay the tax to the government. Okay, so it's a nice, simple, elegant solution. We call it a Pigouvian tax because it's named after an economist, Arthur Pigou, A.C. Pigou. Uh, and so in his honor, uh, he, he had talked about this problem of externalities and prescribed this, uh, this solution. And so we named that tax uh, after him. So that moves us on to Pigouvian subsidies, which is going to be very similar to a Pigouvian tax. But now you do it in a circumstance where you have a positive externality. So over here on the left, we've got our market before there's been any subsidy. And uh, this demand curve shows the value that consumers are getting out of purchasing units of the good. This red supply curve shows the private cost. And this is where we expect the market to end up because once the buyers and sellers reach that point, there's no more gains from trade that they can capture themselves. However, their transactions in this market are having a spillover benefit to other people, right? So this is the, the extra security that they're providing to other people in the neighborhood who haven't hired security guards for themselves. Or this is the extra uh, property value that they're conferring on neighboring properties when they redevelop uh, some area into a park or a mall or a theater or something that's that's valuable and is going to attract a lot of people. All right. Uh, 
We don't expect them to get here on their own because it's not profitable to the buyer and seller. If they kept trading out to this quantity, the, the cost to the sellers would well exceed the value to the buyers, they would lose money, and so they'll just avoid those. However, recall that if you give a subsidy to buyers or sellers in a market, you can encourage them to produce and consume more than they would on their own. In this case, we're gonna think about giving the subsidy to the buyers, because that's the easiest way of thinking about what, uh, how that, that fixes the problem. The social value curve is out here, if you give, let's see, uh, we'll use this, uh, the distance between these two uh, curves is the external benefit. And if you set the subsidy equal to the external benefit, you tell the buyers, hey, for every unit, you let's say that this external benefit is $100 per unit. You tell the buyers, every time you buy a unit, we will pay you $100 for making that purchase. Well, now the buyers would be willing to pay $100 more on every single unit that they uh, consume because the government is completely covering that cost. And that is going to result in this demand curve shifting up by an amount exactly equal to that subsidy that you're offering them. And so this demand curve would shift up until it is exactly overlapping the, uh, the, social the social value curve. So the demand curve DS, the demand curve with a subsidy will be equal to the social value curve, all right? And now this socially optimal level of output is exactly the same and is that the equilibrium price will be the same as the uh, socially optimal price and sellers will respond by producing the socially optimal quantity. And again, it might be a little difficult to see just comparing these next to each other, but you can see here, if I just draw a straight line across, the price, the equilibrium price here when I've given the buyers a subsidy is exactly the same as the socially optimal uh, price in this market, okay? So we can make this market efficient. And basically what's happening in this case is the buyers and sellers are acting like this is the only area uh, of gains from trade. But in fact, we're interested in everything under that social value curve and above the social cost curve. So left to their own devices, buyers and sellers will stop trading at this point. And so the gains from trade are this shape here. It's kind of a triangle with the right hand corner clipped off. That's the gains from trade. There's a dead weight loss to the right of the gains from trade, which is all this area below the social value curve, above the supply curve, that we're not capturing, right? Those are gains from trade that society is not getting. But over here, once we've imposed the subsidy or offered the subsidy to the buyers, we're gonna capture all of those gains from trade. So the market becomes efficient. And once again, the beauty of this kind of a system is its simplicity. The government doesn't have to order anybody around, doesn't have to tell them what to do. The only knowledge that the government needs is the knowledge about what is the, the external benefit per unit. They give that subsidy, that op they offer that subsidy to the, um, to the buyers, and then they just let the market do what it wants to do, and that will make the market efficient. So that is it for Pigouvian subsidies. The night, economists tend to really like Pigouvian taxes and subsidies because of their simplicity, because uh, theoretically we can make markets uh, perfectly efficient by using them. In the next couple of videos, we will talk about uh, other methods of making the market more efficient. One is going to be command and control when the government basically uses regulation instead of taxes and subsidies to try to improve outcomes in the market. Uh, the other will be a case where the market sometimes uh, can make itself perfectly efficient by uh, people kind of making side deals with each other. 
Uh, that's, that has to do with the Coase theorem, and we'll talk about that in more detail shortly.